Welcome into the latest edition of ESPN FC. I'm Dan Thomas, joined by Ali Moreno and Stevie Nicker. We'll kick things off with reports in Europe suggesting that Paul Pogba's on his way back to Juventus. Revolution Pogba, says the front page of Tudor Sport. For more on this, oh, the French contingent are here. Julien Laurent and Paul Pogba. What from a, from a, <laughs> Steady, Frank Leboeuf is with us as well. No. Uh, <laughs> Frank, from a French perspective, how excited are you to see Pogba back at Juventus? I am in a way that the last time that I saw him uh, being at 100% is the last season that he played for Juventus, so I'm expecting to see the, the same thing. But I know, you know, uh, going back to a club is not, a, is not, a, is not an easy thing. And uh, we saw that uh, uh, primarily with, uh, with, um, with Manchester United and Paul coming back to, uh, to Manchester. So uh, I don't like the word nostalgia. And it's a little bit of what I feel, you know, when you go back to a club every time you go back because you felt good, everything went well. But uh, then all, it's going to be another era. It's going to be another thing with different players. Uh, will it be as free as he was when he was playing with, uh, with the, the others and, uh, and the Allegri? Uh, hopefully yes, because his win is the best. I'm excited because I want to see Paul at his best, which wasn't the case the past two years. And that's it, J Jules. He's going back to a very different Juventus side. Very different, although same manager, but a team that is more struggling than the team that he first joined. Well, it's nine years ago almost where they were very dominant they had a midfield of PLO, Marquisio, Vidal and then him four four great players for for three positions really in that 4-3-3 formation so yes it would be it would be different but he needs to bring his quality and his talent this is a team that needs needs that they need someone like him they need his leadership they need his his creativity and I think this is this is a good fit because he needed to change he needed he needed a change at United, there were some good things certainly early on, and then he got more and more more difficult with the years. And after six years, I think he he had to do something different. And Juventus is very different. This is a different challenge, especially at his age. He is he, he turned 29 in, in March with the World Cup to come. But I think it would it would be great for him to feel at home and to have that kind of relationship with with the club and with the fans that were were great when he was there the first time round. The reports are that what Locatelli is the only midfielder that's guaranteed to be staying, Stevie. He's coming into a team that's in the middle of a massive transition. Is that the best role for him to be in? Absolutely not. That's kind of the situation he went into at Manchester United. Well, the expectation on him in particular was he was going to be one of the main reasons that United were going to get back to competing at the very highest level. And he couldn't do it. And he's going to a Juventus side who, who, by the way, Serie A's CEO last week said that Serie A is pretty much the Serie B compared to the rest of Europe. The Milan. That Milan, was the, the Milan. I beg your pardon, the Milan yeah. guy. So he's, the expectation on him is exactly what it was when he went to Man United. And he showed he couldn't, he couldn't do it. So the first day he walks through that door, or the first... The first game he plays in, when that whistle blows, everybody at Juventus, including the fans, are going to expect him to be the guy yeah. that pulls them up by the by their boots. I don't know whether he can do it, even in Serie A. Can he carry that expectation, Jules? I think he can. I think he wants to as well. Certainly, that was one of the reasons why he wanted to go there. Uh, I think he wants those responsibilities. I don't think we can compare United and Juventus, even even in this current context for Juventus. This is this is a very different structure. Max Allegri is a much better manager than any of the managers that Paul Pogba worked under United, even Jose Mourinho. So I, I think it's it's a very it's a very different environment, and it's it's a place that he knows so well. It would feel like he he never left really is the same training ground yes of course the players around would be different or oh, some of the there's not many that who were there in the first in his first spell at the club but a lot of the rest would be would be very similar and again he's very much looking forward to it and and I think he's right to and he has to be that kind of attitude he has to be willing to take over with the responsibility he will take the limelight because that's what he does marketing wise it's a great coup for Juventus who who needed someone like him as well you know on that on that aspect of the game and then for the rest I think we can trust him coming back to full fitness, coming back to his best level and having a, a very positive impact on that team and on the league.
Reports then suggesting that's very close to being done. Meanwhile, a transfer we've discussed a lot over the last month. Apparently, Barca have put in their first official bid for Robert Lewandowski. Ali, does this work in your head? <laughs> what, that Barcelona is putting in an offer for Lewandowski? <laughs> the Barcelona are putting their eggs in a Lewandowski-sized basket. No, and, and I've... I've taken that position time and time again simply because of the reports coming out of Barcelona that have been confirmed by Sid Lowe whenever he's been on the show, talking about the fact that Barcelona right now, in order for them to make this happen, they are sacrificing and mortgaging their future. Isn't that what got you in trouble to begin with? So no. No, you, you, you run away from this. And I know it's tempting because you see Lewandowski is there and you feel like, Maybe we can make it happen, but how and what do you need to do in order to make this happen? What do you need to sacrifice? How many pieces do you have to move? How many pieces do you have to move out of place in order to force this into place? That doesn't make sense because financially you're not in a good position. And you seem to be training a direction as to getting out of that financial woe. Why? Why? Oh, why do you then turn right back around and say, you know what? Financial circumstances were difficult. Let's go back in there right. because that was fun. No, you have to be patient. You have to build from within. You have to lean on the young guys that you have available right now. And whenever you find that stability, that financial stability that allows you to walk into a negotiating room and say, we're Barcelona, we have the money, we want that player. Whenever you find that stability, then you can go ahead and do that. Now, not so much. It's like a bunch of children, isn't it? <laughs> Daddy, I want this, I want this, I want that, I want this, with no, no regard to what <laughs> actually has to happen in order for you to get anything. Yeah. It's like a bunch of kids. It's madness. <laughs> <laughs> Jules, does this work in your eyes? I don't know. I understand the deal that they signed last week with the, the, the injection of money into the club, or certainly on the short term. Make, I've made some funds available for, for transfer. Would I spend it on Lewandowski at his age? And the money that that will bring in terms of wages and that transfer fee, by the way, that they will have to pay Bayern Munich. And that I think Bayern are in the right to ask for, for quite a big sum, even for a player who has only one year left on his contract. I'm not, I'm not so sure at all. I, I think I would maybe spend that money if I was to spend any money, because I agree with Ali. I would not spend anything. The only thing I would spend is make sure that Pedri and Gavi stay happy and happy mm. with their contract and they're there for pretty much all their career. I would not risk anything else. And I'm not sure if Lewandowski is worth it. Maybe he is, and maybe time will tell us and show us that he was worth taking that risk and investing on him. And then all the goals he's going to score and all the trophy they're going to win with him. Would have made it worth it? But right now, I'm not so sure I would take the risk. Uh, meanwhile, interesting story that has uh, broke over the last 24 hours. Rumours rife that maybe Jao Felix could be heading to Manchester City. What can you tell us about this, Jules? Is he going to play? Uh, is, is he a new formation? Uh, do, do we now do we now play two, three, five? Is there is there is there um, a scenario where you can put as many forwards as you can? Haaland and Alvarez and Mares and Grealish and De Bruyne and Joao Felix all on the pitch at the same time. I mean, I'm all for it if they can, but. Come on, I think we have to all be realistic and, and reasonable after signing Holland and, and, and Alvarez, even if Sterling was to leave, even if Gabriel Jesus was to leave, which I think they will be, certainly Gabriel Jesus. I don't think Joao Felix is the answer here. I think they need to strengthen the other position, especially in midfield with Fernandinho leaving. And probably Cucurella, left back, will also come and, and reinforce that defence. I don't see any place for Joao Felix in that team or in that rotation. And I, I really don't think he fits an Antonio Conte side or an Antonio Conte style of management if you want so I, I, I was told that this was not true there might be some right. truth in it I don't know but right now it looks to me very very complicated yeah, he's been linked to Spurs as well that's why uh, Jules bringing up Conte how as well how disappointed would he be God, you Felix. just went out don't you oh <laughs> good job Felix please let's be true yeah it'd be like, going to, it'd be like Utopia going to City yes <laughs> after spending half of your half of your every game stuck in your own on your own half of the field to actually be playing the game where you want to play it in the final third. 
Oh my goodness. And for the love of football, we'd love to see him. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> because, <laughs> just what, really. we assume that Joao Felix is a really good, exciting <laughs> young player in the attack. We have seen flashes, we have seen moments, but he has not had the freedom, and to the point that Stevie was making with Diego Simeone, to do all those things. He's been asked to defend, he's been asked <laughs> to track back, he's been asked to be behind the ball. If there was ever a player that doesn't match what the manager wants to do with the whole squad, it is Diego Simeone and Joao Felix. If it's not Manchester City, it has to be somewhere else. Right. But Atletico Madrid under Diego Simeone and Joao Felix just doesn't work. Uh, meanwhile, Jules, of course, we've seen a lot of big strikers make big moves this summer. Speculation that maybe Nkunku could be the next. However, he is staying at Leipzig. Just give us an update on the details that have been released today. Yeah, that's right. There's a new contract for him, which which we mentioned a few weeks ago on the show and with Gab as well. Um, I think we might have even broken the story on, on the website in the sense that despite all the interest and there was plenty of interest for him this summer, he felt that maybe another year at Leipzig with Domenico Tedesco as the manager, playing in the Champions League with, of course, the World Cup coming up for, for, with France as well halfway through the season. It was better for him to to step up and I think it was this, this was the best the best decision it was really wise there's a release close now they, they increase the release close to 60 million euros which is a really good amount for a player like him after the mm. season that he's just had and if he confirms next season and has a similar one all those clubs will be there again for 60 million you go and get and Kunku and it brings you so much he's, he's been so fantastic this year so for me it makes so much sense that he stays another year gets even more experience can confirm the season that he just had and then he will leave for for a top top European club do you agree, Frank? I do, I do, and I'm very pleased to see one player very patient in that new generation. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Benzema and Mbappé this season, uh, top French uh, players at France, but it's true that Nkunku has had a fantastic season being the player of the year in Bundesliga. But I think it's wiser for him to stay maybe one more year to, uh, to get more experience and, uh, and then after uh, fly to, uh, to a big, big club, because I think that guy will... Uh, we fly very high, you know, in the in the world of football because he's a very talented player. Well, just a reminder, of course, not long now until Leipzig season kicks off, and once again, ESPN will be the home of the Bundesliga. Uh, Leipzig away against Stuttgart, and it all starts on August the fifth. Eintracht Frankfurt against Bayern Munich. Meanwhile, it's the dance. 50th birthday. Oh, happy birthday. Today, look at the tribute from Lakeith as well. Oh, well huh? Are you going to read that? <laughs> Say again? You're going to read it? Uh, what, with the blues, it's not over. Hey, there you go. <laughs> this is, of course, talking about his commitment uh, to one day. He coached the national side. He has, however, been heavily linked, hasn't he, to PSG over recent months. Um, asked about that, he said, never say never as a manager. There aren't 50 clubs where I can go. There are two or three possibilities. Um, is he just being polite here, Jules? Never say never. If you're going to take over PSG, surely now is the time to do it. Well, it could be the time to do it, but it also, also could not be because he's waiting for the national team job, which he also says in the interview, whenever Didier Deschamps steps down or, or finishes his time as the, as the France head coach, the job is his. He knows that, we all know it, the French Federation knows it as well. There's, no, there's, 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 there's just no debate. And if that happens in December after the, the World Cup in Qatar, then he has to be free to be ready to go and start working in January. So on that point, the time is with PSG were just not right and I think he knew that we've, we've explained it again many times on the show that's why he didn't take that PSG job he was he was keen he was interested it just felt at a time that was not right I think that opportunity might come back later after he spelled with the French national team and maybe then he will take it but he's right there's only two or three clubs in the world that can hire Zinedine Zidane as the manager and PSG is one of them Frank, you've been consistent on this, saying that you don't think he'll go to PSG because of his links with Marseille. Are you surprised he's come out and said never say never? 
No, because uh, that's that first that's true, that's possible. Uh, he said that uh, as a player, it would have been very difficult to go to PSG, but as a coach, it's different. Uh, Laurent Blanc was a captain of Marseille and he played for Paris Saint Germain, and many other players played in the in both teams for both teams. But uh, it's true that the character and uh, the fact that Zidane is uh, the, the, the boy from Marseille, it would, it would have been very. Uh, um, very difficult for the for the for the uh, uh, Marseille fan to digest the fact that he he will take charge of of Paris. But uh, it's possible in the future. We'll see. I think, as Jules explained, uh, he patiently waiting for for Dijon to uh, to go away to uh, to get his <laughs> spot and uh, and uh, take charge of the national team. Um, you know, it's funny because just one thing that today I never seen a football player being so much celebrated by the uh, by by the um, by the um, by the, the medias and, and and everybody. It's crazy. That guy is a real hero. Uh, he's in, he lives in another dimension, and seeing him with the national team will be a, quite of an achievement for the national team and for himself. Uh, meanwhile, more on PSG, and we've talked about uh, Al Khaifi's quotes, haven't we, over the last couple of days. Interesting stuff he had to say about Lionel Messi. Next season, we will see the best Messi in history. No. Jules, even you with your PSG goggles on, can't believe that. <laughs> As much as I would like to believe it, I, you know, simply because I, because of his age, you can't do at 35, he would be 35. Mm -hmm. What you've been doing at 23, 24, 25 in those teams, the teams that he was playing at for Barcelona. So this is, it would be better than what we saw this season that just finished, uh, for sure. I think he will be better, but he won't be the best in history. No, that's not true. Frank, Frank, say that you were Messi, how much would, November's World Cup preoccupy you in the start of the season? How much are you already thinking about Argentina? And we just lost Frank. Stevie, same question to you. Now I was going to say, how rubbish does that 14 goals and 11 assists look? Well, yes. <laughs> Next to the rest. Yes, exactly. So how's he going to turn around and be the best in well, history ever? Taking a season to settle in. <laughs> Get used to France, Paris. Yeah. Lingo. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that happening. <laughs> Sticking a running start. Does it play on his mind, do you think? Given that everybody says that he has to do it for Argentina to be one of the best ever? I would, I would think it's in his mind. Right. I don't think it affects him, though. Right. You know, you, you can't... He's still 100% committed, whoever PSG are playing Abs against. Absolutely, no question. You, you don't do what he's done over his career without being so mentally strong mm -hmm. you know if you think about it every single time this guy steps on the field the world expects him to be out of this world sure you know to be able to do that for what 14 years do you think just because he hasn't won the world cup that he's going to be not sleeping at night no he understands how great it would be he's probably dreaming of it but it's not going to affect what he does with PSG one bit. We got, we got Frank back. Uh, hey! Wow. Ah, Frank, before you left, I asked uh, whether or not you think the World Cup will be at the back of Messi's mind for the start of PSG and whether or not he'll be 100% committed at the start of the season. Uh, of course he will. Just before, it's, it's a pity we've been cut off and you hung up on me because I said for once very interesting things, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, yeah, I think time Messi. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, you one. missed that. Uh, <laughs> yes, I see. I see. Messi is going to be is going to be spot on, but you have you have the reality of the uh, of the timing. Uh, we, we saw last season that it was quite hard. He's not the Messi that he's been, that that's not only natural, but uh, hopefully he's going to go back to, uh, to his best that we all hope for, uh, for him and for the national team. And to see the best of Messi will definitely help the, uh, the Argentinian side to, uh, to win the World Cup. Well, of course, he'll have a new manager with Pochettino gone, Gaultier coming in. And it's interesting when you take a look at the names and the success that managers have had since 
They left PSG, Unai Emery of course very much among them uh, currently. Uh, back in La Liga, but you take a look at his resume, obviously so successful, certainly when it comes to the Europa League, and so many questions to be asked about his time at PSG, and given everything that we've discussed about Neymar of late, Kay Murray, and sat down with a Villarreal coach and asked him about the egos in that PSG dressing room. When I was there, uh, the, the egos was normal egos as a person, as a player, as a important and players, uh, was very good relationship between them. Uh, I, I shared the, the moment with, uh, with Neymar, with Mbappé, with Cavani, with Di Maria, and really uh, they, they, they were uh, with a commitment to, to help everybody to achieve the, the target. And uh, in the dressing room, really, the, the Usually was was normal this relationship and was uh, their their performances uh, in the pitch on the pitch uh, was uh, when I was there was was good. Uh. Would you be surprised if they let Neymar go? There's a lot of talk that they could let Neymar go. I think he's the best player of the world we can see now, and uh, I think he can show everybody. Uh, his best moment will come. Do you think that it, maybe he's not playing as well as he has been at PSG lately? Maybe he's not the most important player on the team right now? Now they have Neymar, Messi and, and Mbappé. Three amazing players when they are in, the, in, the, in their best moment and when they are motivated for, to achieve together something important like uh, to win uh, important matches against the best teams and to achieve uh, and, and to get uh, the opportunity to, to, to win trophies uh, and the best trophies like uh, Champions League, uh, they will do. How good does that play out? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I'm not, sure how, I'm not <laughs> sure how they're not able to just go. I know. Right. I know. If it's Kane, have a little I sneaky. Uh, uh, a little, with the bread just like Kane. Yeah. Uh, Jules, are you surprised he's being so nice? No, because he's been nice in interviews before. I I don't think he was bitter the way he ended in Paris. I, I, I think he was the one low point. I mean, it's lower than low anyway. It's, it's obviously the remontada and that 6-1 defeat away at Barcelona after after the first leg was the 4-0 win at the Parc des Princes for PSG was one of the greatest games that they've had in the last 10 years since the Qatari took over. So to go from so high to so low was, was big for him and I don't think he ever recovered from it and certainly certainly that ended him really after that we knew he was never going to be there the following season but I don't think he was I don't think he was bitter I think he he learned a lot from the experience and working with that dressing room I think he's nice now by saying what he said but it was tough it was tough for him it was it was a it was it's a head of a dressing room to manage and I think he knows that now but I think this is like his personality as well he's not someone who then criticize a club for letting him go or for 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 treating him the way that PSG did, for example. So I, I, this is exactly what I expected him to say. What do you make of him, Frank, saying that he believes Neymar can still be the best player in the world? <laughs> well, hopefully for Neymar, he's still going to be the, the best player in the world. But, uh, well, he's getting, getting, he's getting a, a little bit political for me. Uh, he's, always be, he's always been a nice person. He's a gentleman. And uh, it's nice for him to, to say those kind of stuff. It comes kind of stuff, sorry, for, 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 uh, to the players. I think, I think Neymar... Um, em Emery had a problem with the media when he was in France. He nicely tried to uh, speak French very quickly where his accent and uh, his French uh, wasn't, w weren't accurate at the time. And uh, everybody made fun of him and teased him. Uh, and uh, he, he put him down a little bit in the, in the level of uh, um, being accepted by the, the, the fans and, uh, and, uh, and being tolerated on the bench of Paris Saint-Germain. Uh, and, and, and the results, and especially the Champions League uh, uh, games against Barcelona and the second leg didn't help him out. I think he wasn't ready for, for me, he wasn't ready to take charge of a big club like Paris Saint-Germain. Just back to the Neymar point, mm -hmm. 
if he focuses, if he trains hard, you know, if he's 100% committed, mm -hmm. can he be the best player in the world? No. Not anymore. Here's the thing. When Messi's drop-off and Ronaldo's drop-off was about to happen, and naturally, we just discussed it, we knew it was coming. At some point, it was going to happen. Neymar was the one that was supposed to fill in the gap. He was the one that was going to take then that next step, and he was going to be the best in the world. And it didn't happen. And since then, he's been surpassed. He's been surpassed by Mbappe. And now he's playing catch up to his own teammate. And good luck with that because Mbappe is not coming back to him. Mbappe will take off from here and become even better than what he already is. So Neymar is not only playing catch up with himself, he's mm. playing catch up with other players that have surpassed him, mainly his teammate, Kylian Mbappe. Every single year, you just look at it, every single year his numbers have got worse. Yeah. So who in the right mind mm. is going to turn around and think that he can turn out, to, uh, maybe not even the best, but even close to it, there's nothing to suggest that whatsoever. Right. And the fact that PSG are interested in, in getting rid of him tells you that they don't believe it either. So, no. You look at that, five years, production's down every single year, anybody else would have got the sack. And your question, your question was, if he focuses, if he trains, right. if he prepares, well, we're assuming <laughs> that he's going to be able to do all of those things. Right. But why hasn't he? He has it in, in his control to be fit, to be ready to go, to be in shape, to prepare, to focus, to concentrate. All those things are under his control. They're not outside of his control. And yet he hasn't been able to do it. So why would you trust it now? Uh, to see the full interview between Unai Emery and Kay Murray, be sure to go over to our YouTube channel. Oh, I hope someone has that food. Mm. Uh, just a reminder then, La Liga back on ESPN next this season. Uh, all the games will be available on ESPN+. Plus. We know the opening weekend, we'll see Barcelona take on Raya Vallecano. Meanwhile, Real Madrid away against Almeria. Unai Emery's Real taking on Vidalit. Being Zidane's birthday gives us the perfect excuse to show his top five La Liga goals. Hey, hello. Beckham to Zidane. That's his bad foot as well. Did he have a bad foot? Oh, look at that. Yeah, that's probably the best way to describe it. So we have bad haircut. <laughs> uh, Roberto Carlos ran out of options. <laughs> to Zidane. Look at that. Yeah. See that? Wow. That cut went to the inside. Oh. How easy. And then just beautifully bending that ball to the far post. Gorgeous. How easy did that look? Uh, very easy. Free kick here against Las Palmas. Yeah. Thank you very much. I looked easy too. Well, I'm surprised the goal even bothered. Look at that. Well, did he bother? I don't think well, he did. He decided. He decided. <laughs> Uh, in at number two, uh, defender here. Mm -hmm. oh, oh my mm -hmm. goodness gracious me. Built, spicy, quality, touch, finish, gorgeous. Uh, at number one, it's against Racing. Hi, yeah, yeah. Oof. Again, this isn't easy. But it makes it look easy. Yeah. It makes that look simple. That's, that's playground stuff. Goodness gracious me, Frank LeBeouf uh, with us, as is Julien Laurent. Jules, would you do that sort of stuff in training as well? Frank, sorry. <laughs> he was... <laughs> <laughs> Frank? I mean, the, the, I, I, you know, I can't even describe, you know, how good the guy was. I mean, I... He was simply a magician. What, what we saw, and, and uh, you showed only the Liga goals, but the, the, the Champions League final goal mm -hmm. that he scored uh, uh, when they won it, the volley from a cross, a very high cross from uh, Roberto Carlos, was the best of the best for me. When you score a goal like that in the Champions League, I mean, it's it, because you belong to the rare football players uh, who can reach the top of the top and that guy was and I saw stuff that he was doing in the training session well <laughs> everybody was fighting as defenders to be with him 
rather be against him because you don't want to be you don't want to be humiliated by him and uh, and with all the smile that's the worst <laughs> frank you mentioned last year when you went out for dinner of course the 98 team that zizou couldn't really go out on the streets afterwards because it would just be manic yeah that uh, yeah that was that day and uh, we had a fantastic dinner and then after we wanted to go for a drink and we went with some players but he decided to go back to his hotel and uh, he was wearing a cap and uh, i realized that uh, life was impossible in paris for him and today again uh, i saw i never seen a player so much of a sport guy so much celebrated uh, by the media uh, because of his uh, birthday uh, is uh, yeah is is the guy he wants to, if he wants to be the president of france i think he can reach the spot i, I think he can be elected that's as simple um, as that can we just show that picture again because it's interesting obviously zidane's 50th birthday so to mark the occasion, Frank has put a picture of him, full face of Frank, <laughs> and the back of Zidane's head. Yeah, yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Can I explain? Because that's the only picture that I have talking to Zizou. That's the rare right. picture. And, uh, and uh, it's just to show, because I put on the, on the post that I made on Instagram, that I'm telling him that he's, gonna, he's never going to uh, double me, overtake me because of my age. Uh, that's the only, on the only thing. I think it was funny uh, to have that picture because it shows the, the guy who did a fantastic uh, uh, documentary also uh, Mr. Meunier uh, about France 98 and uh, that's a famous one that uh, Jules knows about uh, called Les, Les Yeux dans les Bleus and uh, that was just a, a clin d'oeil as we say. Uh, Jules take us back to you growing up and watching him. Yeah, it was it was very special, of course. Even his time in France, I can first when I was when I was young in early nineties. Then he moved to Bordeaux, where they achieved great things with that team and that generation of Lizarazu and Dugarry with him as well, of course. Especially in the UEFA Cup, reaching the final, and then he moved away, of course, to Juventus, where the beginnings were a bit difficult. And then, of course, he all changed with the '98 World Cup and the 2000 Euros. The the, the interview in L'Equipe over 18 pages is is fascinating, of course. Uh, and he, 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 he talks again about the 2000 competition. He said 98 was his year, really, and that was his, that was his final especially. But 2000, this, this team was, and, and Frank was, was a big part of it, of course, that team was unstoppable. Even if they won in a, in a very unforgetting manner, that final against Italy, this was a team that was working on water and working on everybody else. And, and it, was, it was crazy. I, I had the pleasure of, of knowing him a little bit, meeting him, interviewing him recently before the pandemic, and, what a great guy he was and then you you remember those moments 2006 for example was the first World Cup I ever covered uh, and he came back obviously after retiring in 04 came back in 05 to, to take the team to the World Cup and then obviously that World Cup was was iconic for so many reasons one because he carried that team all the way to the final because there was that incredible individual performance against Brazil in the quarterfinal which is from what I've seen in my own eyes sat in a stadium live this is the best individual performance I've ever seen he, he was just unstoppable they could not come near him they couldn't get the ball off him France won one nil. He, he gave the assist to, to Thierry but he was this was his game he was he was on another planet even against Brazil and that was a really good Brazilian team and then obviously the final and what happened with Materazzi this was a, an education to to cover that World Cup being quite close to him and quite close to the team and then obviously what he did as a manager which we never thought he would become even himself mm. never thought he would become a manager let alone a successful one but he's a an incredible character an incredible person as a professional watching him mm. how is that yeah you, right away you know every time he touches a ball there's something special that happens and, and and i'm just looking at it from the perspective of the size of Zinedine Zidane and the set the skill set that he had with his feet usually guys that size are not as clean and as tricky and as good as, they, as he was with his feet. So then he has the strength of his size, natural, and then he has the strength of his feet. So how do you mark him? How do you get close to him? When you go and try to challenge him physically, he said, no, 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 no thanks. You're not coming. You're not getting anywhere near the ball. And then when you think, okay, well, maybe I can get him with quickness. No, because his feet were quick too. Mm. He can get around you that way because of how skillful he was. 
he was something else. And, and maybe because of his personality that it, it, it's just kind of quiet and just kind of somehow he seemed to go under the radar. But he quietly put together one of the best careers in terms of accomplishments and then individual performances. A player of a generation, and yet when we talk of the best ever, doesn't quite come up, and yet we should consider how good Zinedine Zidane he was at his very best. Probably one of the, I think one of the best ways to sum somebody like him up is from a player's point of view. I can look at my career, mm -hmm. and I think I was pretty good. I did a lot of good things, yep. playing some great teams, won some big trophies. But I wouldn't dream of trying some of the things mm -hmm. that he did nonchalantly right. and on a regular basis. <laughs> I mean, that, that just sums it up for me. Somebody who played, who thought they played at the top, yes. couldn't even dream like a of doing the stuff that this guy does on a regular basis. Easily. I wouldn't even dream of trying it. Yeah. The things that he does easily. Yeah. Easily, that gliding, that when I think of Zidane, I think of him gliding on the field. Everybody yeah. else is running, he's gliding. How much would a Craig hate this segment? Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, 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 if I can add something. Go on, Frank. Dan, uh, when, uh, I, re I remember when he, when he first came with the national team and then he stayed and uh, he had a car crash accident um, uh, in, just before the, the European Championship in England in 96. Remember that Aimé Jacquet didn't take Cantona. Well, he wanted to take Jean Cantona, but Cantona didn't want to play as a striker. He wanted to play as a number 10. But Jacquet uh, stood up uh, with, uh, with Zidane and Jorka F. So Cantona decided to not go. Ginola didn't come. The media criticized uh, Zidane b uh, for his performances, but also in 98, because he got uh, red carded after the third game, uh, he didn't have the, uh, the, the, um, the level that everybody expected. But you know how strong he has been, uh, because we all think with the glamorous uh, you know, aspect of him, that we saw that everything was quite of easy and, uh, and, uh, and perfect. Well, it, it hasn't been. As just mentioned, it was uh, very hard at the beginning for, uh, in Bordeaux, but also in Juventus. But the guy fought hard. He never gave up and, uh, and reached uh, the top level because of his character as well, not only because of his skill, and became the top, top player that he has been from 98, and I would say from the quarterfinal against Italy to uh, mm -hmm. 2006 and the uh, Brazil game that in quarterfinal that Jules was mentioning before. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, meanwhile, it is the final Gab and Jules podcast of the season. It's available now to listen to over on the website. Be sure to go and check it out. Uh, that is it. That brings us to the end of today's show. Be sure to stay tuned, though, as Frank and Jules will be back for Extra Time, which is next. Welcome into the latest edition of Extra Time. Ali Renner, Stevie Nichol, Frank LaBeouf with us as well. Mm. For the panel, who's been the biggest disappointment to their club and fans? Well, mm. Neymar at PSG, uh -huh. Pogba at Manchester United, Hazard at Real Madrid, or Lukaku at Chelsea? <sighs> wow. Frank? Uh, for me, I would say Hazard in Real Madrid, because it's been so many years that he's been there and nothing happened, uh, where I would say that uh, Lukaku only spent a year at Chelsea, Pogba had some good years and, uh, and played, at least played, <laughs> which wasn't the case for Eden Hazard. And Neymar had some good times, uh, but definitely didn't bring uh, the, the, the best in his luggage when he came from Barcelona. But from all those players, with all the expectations that I had from all of them, I think Eden Hazard was the biggest disappointment for me. Yeah, Hazard top. Yeah. Yeah. Stevie, yeah. Uh, yeah. Who have we got second? Initially, I th initially I was thinking Neymar. Well, because if, if you if you were brought in for the crazy amount of money he came in for, he was supposed to deliver the Champions League. But he, we've still seen brilliance from Neymar, haven't we, in the PSG shirt? Which is certainly we haven't seen certainly for Lukaku. Which is which is why I switched to Hazard because, yeah. as Frank said, we haven't even seen him play. 
Uh, no, <laughs> to the point to where you can turn around and say Real Madrid went on to win Champions League yep. without zero participation exactly. from Ian Hazard. They, yep. they did not need him at all. Uh, Frank, will Gautier be a good appointment for PSG in your opinion? Who that? Gautier. Gautier. Oh yeah, I texted Chris. Yeah, uh, Galtier, Galtier. I texted Galtier. Christophe. Uh, oh, okay. This is fir his first name. I texted Christophe uh, to uh, to know a little bit better. He didn't make up. He didn't make up his mind when I texted him like two days ago. Uh, but I I love the guy. I followed him. Uh, he was uh, one of my. Uh, opponent when he was playing for Marseille and I was playing for Toulon when we were very young so like 30 years ago I saw him in Lille um, and uh, he's an absolutely fantastic guy on top of being uh, absolutely brilliant and he has the mm. character to uh, uh, hopefully hold a dressing room he doesn't care about the player if they don't do the job they won't play I believe that Paris Saint-Germain made the right choice I oh. hope for that did he reply to your text, Frank? Mm. <laughs> yes, of course. He said he wasn't, uh, he, he wasn't done yet. He didn't say more, but he said oh. if I need anything, because I offered him my, uh, my help for in Paris, he needed anything, and he said I will uh, call you. So oh. that's it. What help were you going to offer, <laughs> Frank? Uh, no, not just uh, if he needs anything for himself, his wife, his kids, no. uh, whatever he needs, because I live close to Frank. Not a surprise. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, it's why, it's why I am. It's a team player. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, for all, in your opinion, what is the best individual performance in one World Cup game? <sighs> Uh, here we go. Yeah. Oh. We go. I think you know. Uh, 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 Maradona, uh, I think you know. <laughs> I would say Frank LeBeouf 98 World Cup. Oh. Yeah. No. Oh, no. yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were doing that. I was thinking of Maradona against England. Yes. Uh -huh. yes that, that was a good one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, Zidane against Brazil. Zidane against Brazil, 2006. The only Brazilian on the field was Zidane. He was on the French side. Yeah. Mm. That was bad. Def definitely bad. 986. <laughs> uh, no. Ali? Diego Armando Maradona. Uh, Armando Maradona. Cheated. Huh? Cheated, didn't he? Uh, I remember... Um, Cheated in style. In the, the goal call. Cheater. I was, uh, I was obviously a little kid in, in Venezuela. Yes. Diego Armando Maradona after he scores the... Big goal on the run. El monstruo del fútbol. That touched me in the heart. Oh, <laughs> I was, that touched me. I was crying. Mm. Yeah. Ali, with a mix of talented young players like Valverde, Araujo, Nunez, Bentoncourt, and veterans such as Suarez, Cavani, and Godin, also combined with improving results over the last few months, would you consider Uruguay as dark horses for this year's World Cup? Dark horses to win it? No but a team that could be a very difficult out. Once and if they get out of their group, their ability to defend, they're gonna fight. The biggest question that Uruguay is gonna have to figure out is, what do you do with Luis Suarez? I don't think that Luis Suarez should start over Darwin Nunez, and that's a major decision to make yes. if indeed you're keeping Luis Suarez on the bench. But the truth of the matter is, when you're looking at both players side by side, especially if Darwin Nunez gets off to a good start with Liverpool, how do you keep him on the bench? Uh, I, I don't think at this point in his career, Luis Suarez can give you a whole lot as a starter. May just be the guy that provides you with a goal off the bench. Speaking of the bench, start, bench, drop. Harry Kane, Wayne Rooney, Alan Shearer. Mm. <sighs> mm. Well, well. I got to wow. go with Shearer. Shearer? I got to go with starting Shearer. Yep. He benched Rooney. And he dropped Kane. Goodbye, wow. Harry Kane. He gone. To be fair, that's that's a, that is a fantastic question because you're talking about three proper players. Very much so. Frank, do you agree? Shearer, Rooney, Kane? 
Well, as much as I will change my mind for Shearer because he blocked my nose twice and because he wasn't <laughs> a very nice guy when he was playing, uh, but I met him. I met him again during the uh, Champions League final, and we talked a little bit, and he was very, very nice. Uh, I will still put Rooney for me start wow. on the bench. Shearer and Kane dropped. Why Rooney? Why does he get the nod, Frank? Aside from the broken noses. <laughs> Uh, no, because uh, I think the, what I saw from Everton to Manchester United with Rooney was absolutely spectacular. That was more consistent, I would say, with Shearer, but Rooney have brought something special to the game in England with his craziness, but also with his uh, thought about football and the way that he wanted to, to make it spectacular. The uh, bicycle kick that is called in a, in a derby uh, against Manchester City was absolutely fantastic for me. What, what would you do if part of that question would be early days Michael Owen? If that was if if that was if that was what Michael Owen became as a player and continue on on that path obviously injuries were an issue but that version of Michael Owen compared to these guys? No. Nah. No. no. Those three, those three, hundred percent win games regularly on their own. I don't think you could say that about Michael Owen. I'm just saying, '98 Michael Owen. I'm not talking about whatever he became. Yeah. I'm just saying in that moment in time. Uh, again, I'll, I'll use the same uh, argument. Ali, if you Shira, make so, Shira, Rooney, and Kane don't need anybody else on the field beside them. Okay. Michael Owen, I think, did as mm -hmm. good as he was then. Go on, Frank. I had the chance <laughs> to play against Michael Owen from 96 to 2001 and you were mentioning the 98 World Cup. It was, it was fast. It was fast and direct, but I think it was easier to cope with him. Uh, if you had to put somebody like Albert Ferrer uh, coming from Barcelona to Chelsea, it's what we did with me covering Albert from the, the, the runs from uh, uh, Owen behind the defense. Uh, easier to cop than Shearer with his physical aspect and the experience or also uh, uh, Rooney, uh, I never play against Kane but for me you cannot compare uh, Shearer and Rooney to, uh, to Owen. I almost retired because of Michael Owen. <laughs> played for Sheffield Wednesday Reserve Back yeah. problem. against Liverpool Reserve <laughs> yeah. and I think Owen was 16. Second half he sat in front of me, there's a ball being played up to him, and I'm like, I got this kid, no danger. Yeah. And then I went, where'd he go? <laughs> I was like, where'd he go? And as I'm still looking for him, he's running back with his hand in the air after putting the ball in the back of the net. Wow. I was like, I was sat on the bus afterwards, yeah. and I'm thinking, that's it. Maybe it's time I stop. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but you fought through it. But then I realised that with Michael Owen. Yes. <laughs> about, yeah. about three months later, he was scoring all kinds of goals for the first team. So. Final question. Which relationship do you find the most interesting? Gab and Dennis Bergkamp, mm -hmm. Robbo and Thierry Henry, or Craig with Seven Herc? <laughs> <laughs> right. You wouldn't have seen yesterday, but interesting enough, <laughs> Robbo, Frank, was asked to rank in order Dennis Bergkamp, Ian Wright and Thierry Henry. He had Henri third. He had Burkamp first, Ian Wright second, because mm. he didn't like Henri's character in the final seasons at Arsenal. Well, he's wrong. Yeah, <laughs> for me, uh, I can't even understand. I mean, I, I love Ian Wright. I played against Ian Wright, but I played many times, and with Thierry Henry, the guy was spectacular. So you cannot put Thierry Henry in the third spot. Never, impossible. So. You're wrong, my man. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, Gab revealed this week also that he has a dislike for Dennis Burkamp and the way that he played. Hold on a second. Dennis, you're up to there. Do you remember Robbo, the last time he was on, said to me about being biased? Yes, I well, yes, Stevie, that went I viral. Has that, that got bias written all over yeah. it from Robbo? Yes, yeah. <laughs> Ian Wright ahead of Terry Henry. Right. Right, he was fantastic, but yeah. it wasn't Terry Henry. Uh, yes.
We do remember <laughs> Robert being angry. <laughs> yeah. That was Champions League final. Yeah, that was very right. entertaining. Frank was standing next <laughs> yeah. to us. Yeah. 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 Hey, hey. I'm over here at the stadium. Yeah. I saw the game yeah. live. Oh, uh, yeah, that was your Liverpool blinkers, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. um, so, go, going back to Dennis Perkamp, Gab did, doesn't like the way that he conducted himself on the pitch, uh, Frank. Uh, and, and he's right. I mean, I played against Beckham, but I said uh, the last show that I, I said that I had some uh, problems, you know, saying in the newspaper that uh, Dennis Beckham was dirty. What I meant, because I was stupid at the time, is that, that he knew how to get dirty and to get rid of the opponent. He could he could stamp on your on your feet, or he could yeah. kick a, a elbow you on your stomach. He knew he was he was a tough guy. He wasn't only a technical sweet guy, you know, uh, like you could imagine, but he was only fair. For me, he was a spectacular player. If Arsenal right. won everything that they won and, and with him and Andreas and Wenger, they have to thank Dennis Bergkamp. So I, I won't agree with uh, Bergkamp uh, the way Gab tried to define him. I just only agree with the fact that he knew how to get dirty. Bergkamp was brilliant. But he's one of those players that you hate because he doesn't kick in, he doesn't look at you and kick you. Right. He's one of those guys that would clip Frank in, in the ankles as he's running past him and give it all that. Oh, so, so, <laughs> oh, didn't, oh, no, it was an accident. Yeah, yeah. he did it all the time. He did it all the time. I saw him doing it a million times. Just kicking, just clipping people's heels, tripping right. them up. Just cowardly stuff. Okay. You know. Mm. So I know exactly. Did you exactly. ever call him out for it? No, no. I only played against him a couple of times. I'm talking. I'm talking generally, not the couple of times I played against him because I was too busy doing my own job. Yeah. But watching the games, you could see it. Oh, I could see it every time. In terms of the every question, is it the relationship between Craig and Seb and Herc? Or could we make it just a relationship between Seb and Herc? Um, I think I think Seb and Herc are one entity. Oh, okay. In this question. Okay. Yeah. Actually, you could add a lot of other names to Seb and Herc. Uh, yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, we can be. I, it's, it's a dot 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 situation. Yeah. yeah, I don't think there's enough characters on Twitter for that. Uh, that is it. We'll be back tomorrow for more. Thank you very much to Frank, to Ali, and uh, Stevie. Um, I think Craig's back tomorrow. Isn't he? Are you off? Are you here tomorrow, Stevie? No. Nope. Oh, there you go. I am not. Oh, so Craig and Shaka in the studio, I imagine. Hey, hey.